Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and our minds so we may feel and sense your presence. May that presence move through us as we hear your Gospel and inwardly digest it, and let it transform our lives. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So, I'd like to take a moment before I launch the sermon, you know, preacher's prerogative, if you will, just to say how excited I am to be with you all. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to be joining the St. Matthew's family. I've been looking forward to this for a really long time, and I'm very excited to see what ministry that we get into in the future. And with that in mind, for my very first sermon with you all, I want to talk to you about my nanny's pancakes. Don't worry, we'll go somewhere with it, I promise. <laughs> so I want to tell you about these pancakes. So my nanny um, was my father's mother, my grandmother on his side, and she recently passed away in January. So these pancakes are all more meaningful to me. You see, when my sister and I were younger, we would go all the time to go visit her. And she lived and grew up in rural Virginia. I mean, like, country bumpkin land. So you know she knew how to cook. <laughs> and so every morning when we were there, she'd get up, and we'd all go into the kitchen. She'd whip out her cast iron skillet. That's how you know you're in the South. Mm -hmm. Cast iron skillet. And she'd flood it with butter. And then she would make these homemade buttermilk pancakes. They're about the size of a sand dollar. And that butter that she put in the pan, it just made the edges of these pancakes just golden brown, and crispy. There's a nice little crunch to it. And the butter, you could just taste it, so all the way through on the edges. But then the centers were light and fluffy. Y'all want these pancakes, right? <laughs> Too bad I never learned how to make them. <laughs> but those pancakes were amazing. Now, we'll come back to those pancakes. So I promise we'll come back to those. But I actually want to invite us at this point to share a little bit like I just did. Trust me, I see the hesitation. We'll go somewhere, and I promise it'll be good. I want us to pair up two people. Just make sure it's not a family member. I want us to talk with people who aren't family. And for two minutes, one minute each, I'll keep time, so don't worry about it. I want you to share with them a food experience from your childhood. Think you can do that? All right, go. Two minutes of food experience from your childhood. So how did that feel? Yeah, that felt good, right? Talk about some.
memorable food, something that was meaningful to us, something that was powerful to us? Let me tell you what I saw. First of all, y'all were a little hesitant with me. They are like, I don't know if we like this new assistant yet. <laughs> but once you started sharing and you kind of broke that ice, y'all's energy picked up a lot. And y'all were like just talking and sharing. There was this passion that um, this was a part of yourself that you hadn't shared with them before, that you just <coughs> wanted to. Like the experience of it was so good. It was so easy to share that joy. And some of y'all were drooling in the back. So I want to know what y'all were talking about later. But that, that ease of sharing, that joy that, uh, from that experience, I want us to hold that and take it with us into the gospel. You see, Jesus is talking about that kind of joy, that kind of sharing. That's what Jesus is modeling for us. We find Jesus and he's come to his hometown of Nazareth after being baptized and gathering with disciples. He's had these transformative experiences with God. His life has forever changed. And he comes into Nazareth and he's, he's excited. He wants to share these things with his loved ones, with his friends, the people he's known his whole life. He's wanting to share with them how God has changed his life. And what we see is Jesus' family and friends didn't want to hear that. You know, they rebuked them. They, they had problems hearing that. But the important thing here is seeing what Jesus does in the face of that. He keeps proclaiming. He keeps sharing those experiences. He heals people. He embodies those experiences and his actions. And he pairs it with going into those relationships. And when people didn't want to hear it, when people didn't want to accept that gift, he wiped his hands clean and went out. He went to other villages to keep doing that, to keep finding, like, keep finding people that wants to hear about these gifts, this experience he's had with God. And that life that he's modeling, that way of living that he's showing us, it's not just for him, is it? Because you see, when he goes out to the villages, he calls upon the disciples, and he says, no, you're going to model the same thing. If you're going to be my followers, this is what you do. He gives them the power to do good works, to go out and you know, embody the gospel in their actions. But then he says, go and proclaim this. Tell them how you have been changed by God. Tell them how God has loved you and has healed you and helped you. Share with them your love with God. Build a relationship. And he said in the midst of all that, you know, if they want to take it and accept it, great, keep going. But if they don't want to receive it, knock the dust off your feet and keep going. You see, there's a word for this. And I'm going to dare to use it in this church. So don't kick me out. <laughs> but Jesus is talking about evangelism. I know, right? It's Episcopalians. We don't use that word often. Often when we hear that, we kind of cringe a little bit because some thoughts come into our mind about what that word entails, evangelism, evangelism. It's not a very good word in our book. Um, and I think there's three reasons for that, so we're, we're going to look on that for a second. The first is, we just have this societal understanding of evangelism that it's, it's, it's cringeworthy. We don't like it. You know, when we hear about evangelists, what pops to your mind? People who go knocking on doors and they're handing out pamphlets and booklets. But it's more than just handing out the stuff. It's, oh, these are the things we believe, and you have to believe these things. You have to convert us. You're going to go to hell. These are, like, if you don't believe X, Y, Z, and one, two, three manner, you don't get it. It's this forcing, this pushing us that we don't really like. And as a society, we kind of said that that's what evangelism is. So that's a problem. And then connected with that, another reason why I think we cringe is Alongside that, in some parts of our tradition, there's this idea or this expectation that to be a true evangelist or to do true evangelism means you have to have results. You know, how many butts in the pews did you get this week? How many people did you save their soul? How many people did you convert to Christ? And that's problematic, too. So we'll put those over here. And the third reason I think we struggle with this and we don't like to use this word, I think, is a very valid reason. Because whether we agree with these societal definitions of it or not, it requires vulnerability with people. It requires us to go out amongst our families and our friends and people 
people that we don't really know and share with them a part of ourselves that we rarely talk about and rarely share. You see, our society tells us, you know, you get up and you go to work, and when you're out in public, what are the two things that you never talk about in public? Religion and politics. And when you come home, you don't really want to talk about either one of those with your family either, especially at Thanksgiving. Um, so, pinhole and vulnerability. And go back to these definitions of evangelism that we as a society have kind of like taken on. Compare that to what Jesus is modeling in the gospel and what he's commissioning the disciples to do. For me, they don't add up. You see, I don't see Jesus modeling a way of pushing a certain belief on people or saying you have to believe this way or you have to do X, Y, Z. Jesus isn't doing that. Jesus is going out and sharing God's love. He's going out and building relationships with people and saying, hey, I had this transformative experience. When I was in relationship with God. So much so that it changed my life. And I want to share it with you. It's gift giving. The model that Jesus is showing. Is more of like a sower of seeds. Like he talks about later on in the gospel. Of, you know not caring where the seeds go. But you go sowing all these wonderful experiences. Of God's love and God's joy. And healing in the world. And wherever they land. That's up to God and that person to cultivate them. And to nourish them and grow it. See, Jesus isn't saying go out and convert people. He's saying go out and proclaim the goodness of God that you have experienced in your life. And so with that in mind, with a new definition, I'm going to ask us to do something. We're going to go back to that vulnerability and we're going to practice being vulnerable with one another. With that same person that you were just sharing about that food experience with. Again, two minutes, same person, one each. I want you to describe or tell them a moment in your life when you felt God's love. Now, this is going to require some vulnerability, so share as comfortable as you are. But I challenge you to go deep in this because it can be rewarding. A moment when you felt God's love in your life.
and she was a mother of five children while she worked full time at a textile factory. And she was basically raising her children on her own because her husband was an alcoholic and a cheater. You know, she had gone through so many trials and tribulations in her life that I was just astounded hearing this as a child. And yet, when the world could have very easily turned her bitter and cruel and hateful because of those experiences, she was the most loving, kind, generous, joyful, faithful woman I have ever met. And I learned why she was that way at that kitchen table. It was because of God. She shared how each and every single day of her life, in each and every single moment, she called upon God and had just shared with my sister and I how God gave her the strength and the fortitude and the love to face this world and to be joyful about it. God's love was so deep for her that it changed her life. That was where I learned of God's love. It was at that kitchen table that I met God face to face at such a young age. And it changed me. It put me on the path that led me here. And if she hadn't been making those pancakes and we hadn't been sitting down for breakfast, who knows what my life would have turned out to be. But brothers and sisters, this is the work we are called to do. To take these moments that we have in our walk with faith and share them with others. Give them a gift. So, with that in mind, once we have gathered up here in a few moments, and we have been fed by the body and blood of Jesus, by the bread and the wine, once we've been strengthened and nourished and sent out into the world, I challenge us, myself <coughs> included, to find moments in our lives this week and beyond, but start with this week, to share with those around us experiences of God's love in your life. Maybe it's a family member or a friend or a neighbor or a coworker. Hey, I don't care. It could be the butcher at your grocery store. Find someone and offer them that gift. And name how God has been powerful in your life and invite them into that. And if they don't want to take the gift, that's fine. Knock the dust off your feet and keep going. But. If they accept that gift and are curious for more, or better yet, in response to your gift, they give you one in return, that's a moment. That is a door. That is a window that we have opened for the Holy Spirit to blow right through. And we've had a seed planted. And from that seed of love that we planted with God, maybe this world will become a little less hateful and a little more loving. And maybe we'll be a little less cynical and a little more joyful. And maybe we'll be a little less broken and a little more whole. Maybe, just maybe, in how we share our walk of life with others, God's kingdom can be revealed more fully in our lives now and in the lives of those around us. Amen. Amen.